formato virtual a través del cual podemos atender las conferencias magistrales y las presentaciones de los trabajos eh, de los primeros a través de medios digitales, así como interactuar con ellos por medio de las herramientas provistas por el comité organizador. Este cambio de paradigma nos llevará a adquirir nueva experiencia en el empleo de las tecnologías de la información y comunicación en la organización y realización de este tipo de reuniones académicas y se convierten además en una alternativa muy valiosa para dar continuidad a la celebración de nuestro congreso muy a tono con la era digital en la que vivimos hoy en día y las tendencias actuales en la difusión del conocimiento. Pero además, en esta ocasión, como dije al principio, también como parte de los festejos académicos del cincuentenario del ICAT, hemos conjuntado la celebración del Congreso SOMI 35 con el primer Simposio Nacional de Biosensores, en el que se explorarán nuevas áreas de oportunidad para fortalecer el diseño y desarrollo de estos, de estos dispositivos. Los sensores presentan un número muy amplio de aplicaciones en el monitoreo del ambiente, detección de enfermedades en la industria alimentaria y farmacéutica, entre muchos otros. En México se cuenta con un importante número de grupos de investigación enfocados en el diseño de estos dispositivos, así como en su desarrollo, por lo que hemos decidido llevar a cabo esta primera reunión en conjunto con el SOMI. Así, este encuentro permitirá también analizar y discutir parte del avance que se presenta en el área de biosensores en un ámbito nacional e internacional para fortalecer lazos académicos en pro del conocimiento científico. De esta manera, contaremos con seis conferencias magistrales de expertos de primer nivel en instrumentación y biosensores provenientes de instituciones académicas de México, Canadá, España y Suecia, las cuales serán eh, dictadas a lo largo de los tres días de celebración del Congreso y el simposio, así como con la presencia de alrededor de 90 trabajos de los participantes en formato de video seleccionados por el Comité científico técnico entre 12 campos distintos y alrededor de 50 áreas temáticas de instrumentación y biosensores. En esta ocasión, los participantes provienen de casi 30 instituciones. A todos los participantes, nuestro reconocimiento y gratitud al hacer posible la realización de estas actividades a través de sus interesantes contribuciones. También quiero reconocer el trabajo realizado por todos los integrantes del eh, Comité Organizador del Congreso SOMI 35, integrado por académicos de los eh, diferentes departamentos del ICAT, y agradecer particularmente, con motivo del cincuentenario del ICAT, a todos aquellos que desde hace 41 años han realizado y mantenido vigente esta actividad, en especial al maestro Gerardo Ruiz Botello, así como a los impulsores del primer sinario, sin olvidar el importante apoyo brindado y la contribución al Congreso que realizan cada año la unidad de cómputo, la coordinación de difusión y la Secretaría Administrativa del ICAT, así como a quienes apoyan en la transmisión de las actividades a través de los canales de YouTube, del ICAT, del SOMI y de otras redes sociales, y a quienes se hacen cargo del diseño de imagen del Congreso. Por supuesto, merece particular mención el trabajo de selección de los trabajos que cada año realiza el Comité Científico Técnico del Congreso a través de la participación de especialistas del ICAT y otras instituciones nacionales e internacionales para conformar un programa de calidad e interés para la comunidad instrumentista participante, así como el trabajo de edición de las memorias por parte del personal académico de diferentes departamentos del ICAT. Finalmente, quisiera expresar mi particular y profundo agradecimiento a la coordinación de la investigación científica de la UNAM, 
sin cuyo apoyo a lo largo de los años y en particular en esta ocasión, estas actividades académicas no habrían sido posibles. Les deseo y les auguro el mayor de los éxitos en la celebración del SOMI 35 Congreso de Instrumentación y el primer Simposio Nacional de Biosensores, ambos en su primera edición virtual, con la expectativa de seguir contando con su interés y entusiasta participación en las actividades por venir. A todos, muchas felicidades y mucho éxito. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctor Zanella, por este alentador mensaje. La verdad es que es una eh, inyección de ánimo y de, este, de, de energía para llevar a cabo este, este congreso y para eh, continuar con él. Sí, así como con el nuevo esfuerzo que empezaremos a hacer en el ICAT a partir de hoy a través del tema de los biosensores, con el simposio biosensores, ¿verdad? Eh, eh, muy bien, enseguida eh, quisiera yo eh, presentar a la, a, a, a la doctora, de nuevo, eh, a la doctora Claudia Rodríguez. En este caso, eh, ya en su calidad, eh, de moderadora de nuestra primera eh, eh, conferencia magistral que va a dictar el doctor Daniel Aili, precisamente proveniente de, de, de Suecia. Eh, entonces, eh, sin más preámbulo y para darle el, eh, eh, paso a la presentación del eh, doctor Aili y después a la, ya a la, al, al desarrollo de su conferencia, le pediría yo a la, a la doctora Claudia Rodríguez que por favor eh, se haga cargo de la moderación de la siguiente conferencia. Muchas gracias. Hola, muchas gracias. Gracias al doctor Rodolfo por eh, igualmente el, eh, de acuerdo al doctor Gerardo en, en, en concordancia con él, con este alentador eh, um, mensaje, sobre todo porque es la primera vez que se hace esta reunión en el área de biosensores a nivel nacional. Agradezco mucho todo el apoyo eh, y muchas gracias, Gerardo. Y bueno, buenos días a todos, buenas tardes y bienvenidos por todos los, que, los participantes y los que nos escuchan. Vamos a dar comienzo a las actividades de este día con la conferencia magistral del doctor Daniel Aili. Le voy a dar en, en inglés su, presentación, eh, su introducción. Um, Uh, it is uh, with great honor that I may now introduce to you Professor Daniel Ailey. He's an expert in the area about sensor with a master's degree in biological engineering, uh, obtaining a doctorate in sensor science, both at uh, Lin Linköping University, Sweden, carried out two postdoctoral uh, studies at the Un Institute of Biomedical mm -hmm. Engineering, Imperial College, London, and Nanyang uh, Technological University, Singapore, He currently works at uh, Linköping University, Sweden, as a professor in molecular physics. He is head of the Molecular Material Laboratory and the Division of Molecular Physics Department of Physics, Chemistry and Biology, is a supervisor of graduate doctorates, uh, has obtained grants and awards, such as Future Research Letter um, by SSF, Wallenberg Academy Fellow, KAW, the um, Vinova VR Joint Column Biologics, um, the uh, uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Nordic Prize for Surface and Colloid Chemistry, the Amberska Awards, Royal so Swedish Academy of Science, um, participated as a member of the Editorial Board of Scientific Reports, member of the Editorial Advisory Board of Peptide Science, member of the board of the strategic research area of the Swedish uh, government in material science on functional materials at Linköping uh, University. Um, uh, he is a grand evaluator at the German Research Foundation, Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research, expert reviewer, uh, Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research, external grants evaluator, um, and reviewing, uh, reviewer in many journals with high impact as in natural chemistry and other important um, journals. 
Um, he is a member of the Swedish Chemical Society, the Scandinavian Biomaterial Society, the European Biomaterial Society, and uh, the Material Research Society. Welcome, uh, Professor Daniel Ali, and uh, welcome to this meeting. And thank you for uh, as a, the, to participate in this event. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to share some of our work with you today. So let's see if I can share my screen. Great. Yes, uh, yes it's okay. okay. Perfect. Just give me a second. Let's see if I can. I just need to minimize um, the videos here. Okay. So <clears throat> thank you very again for that very kind introduction. Uh, so uh, I will talk to you today about our work on anaplasmonic biosensors for various clinical and industrial applications. Um, so as you heard, I'm a professor at Linköping University at the Division of Biophysics and Bioengineering. So um, just to give you an idea where this is in the world, uh, Linköping is uh, uh, in Sweden uh, on the Scandinavian peninsula, uh, about uh, 200 kilometers south of Stockholm, the capital of Sweden. So we're, we're, we're still quite a bit south of the Arctic Circle. Uh, but uh, winter is coming, apparently. Um, so I wish I, I were in, in Mexico. I heard you had a slightly warmer weather than we have. So Linköping University, it's uh, one of Sweden's larger universities. It has a bit more than 30,000 students and 4,000 employees. Um, in the biosensor community, Linköping University is, I would guess, most well-renowned for these three gentlemen um, that ha have affiliations with, with, uh, with our university here. Professor Tony Turner uh, was in the same department here as I, and he's, as you know, one of the front figures of uh, the biosensor community. And then, as well as Professor Ingmar Lundström and Professor Bo Liedberg, who uh, was... Um, pioneering the work on, on optical biosensors based on surface plasma resonance, which is very close to my field as well. Um, <clears throat> so a uh, biosensor, um, uh, as you're well aware of, is an analytical device for detection of chemical substances, uh, which we typically refer to as analytes. Um, the devices, they combine a biological component with a physical chemical detector. That's what's unique to biosensors. And this biological component, uh, it provides, uh, uh, I mean, means for specific recognition of, of analytes. Whereas the transducer, this detector, then converts this by recognition event into a signal that we can uh, detect. Uh, the bioreceptors or ligands, as we often call them, are, I mean, it can be essentially any kind of biomolecule, uh, such as DNA, proteins, or peptides, or even entire cells or cell fragments or even tissues. Um, the transducer is usually converting this interaction to an optical or electrical or electrochemical or signal or, or measures changes in heat due to these interactions. And then typically we also require some sort of amplification of this signal uh, for us to record it properly. And in my work, I primarily, I mean, interested in optical sensors and using proteins and peptides um, um, as, as ligands or receptors. Um, <clears throat> and my work is, uh, as I mentioned, quite much inspired by the seminal work of uh, Professor Liedberg and Lundström on surface plasma resonance. Um, and um, SPR um, uh, or SPR based uh, biosensors is probably the most widely distributed or used biosensor, at least for uh, research purposes uh, today. And, and they come from many different companies. Uh, but the work of uh, Liedberg and, and Lundström uh, was uh, 
commercialized by the company Bia Corno, uh, which is now owned by Sutiva, uh, formerly GE Healthcare. Uh, so this is a generic optical biosensor technology for biomolecular interaction analysis, uh, which, um, let me see. <clears throat> Uh, which essentially it's, so it's an optical technique which uses uh, the properties of uh, propagating surface plasmon at the metal dielectric interface such as this gold surface that we see here and then we can uh, make this turn this into an, a biosensor by immobilizing biomolecules on the metal interfacing uh, the medium uh, around the, the metal and then detect uh, ligand analyte interaction as it occurs on the surface. And essentially what we monitor are changes in reflectivity uh, as we change the refractive index in the vicinity of this surface. Uh, so shift in, in, in the reflectivity of, of light uh, irradiated at the surface. And we can do this uh, detection in real time. So look at analyte ligand interaction in, in, as, as it happens on the surface. Uh, and uh, these propagating uh, uh, surface plasma, that's, that, that's our essentially collective electron oscillation that are induced by this visible light, and uh, which essentially result in an evanescent field that propagates into the surrounding medium. Uh, that's what tried to be illustrated here. And that evanescent wave um, essentially propagates around or reaches out uh, roughly 200 nanometers from the surface into the surrounding, which makes this a fairly surface sensitive technique so we can monitor what goes on close to the surface here. Um, <clears throat> and from uh, being a nice to have instrument in, 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 in companies working on, with, with drug development, this has changed quite dramatically over the last 10 years or so to a must have instrument in, in drug development. Um, <clears throat> but uh, these instruments, they are quite pricey. Uh, they are uh, rather complicated to use and to interpret the data. So it's required quite a lot of expertise and also to maintain these instruments. And uh, due to the uh, fairly large sensing depth uh, they are also recording quite a lot of the uh, refractive index changes occurring um, a bit further away from the surface than we are necessarily interested in giving rise to large bulk refractive index shift. Um, and, and this in combination with some other aspects make these uh, instruments very sensitive to temp temperature fluctuations. Uh, and they are essentially optimized for pure samples, uh, low volumes and relatively low flow rates. Uh, but excellent uh, for, for research purposes, especially in drug delivery. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what my, my research is about is essentially to see if we can make cheaper, more robust and flexible optical biosensors with similar performance as uh, you can essentially obtain from surface plasma resonance. Uh, based um, uh, transducers. And uh, this made us look into uh, the field of localized surface plasma resonance. So essentially a very related phenomena to SPR, uh, but uh, uh, using metal nanostructures instead. And um, <clears throat> when having uh, metal particles uh, that are small in size, and small in size typically means less than 100 nanometers, then we can uh, much easier induce collective electron oscillation. Essentially, we don't need any complicated optical setup to do this. So we can just irradiate the particles and uh, we induce these collective electron oscillations, uh, which results then in, in a lot of uh, absorption of the, the visible light as well as scattering. And, and we can see this as a quite pronounced uh, um, extinction band in the visible wavelength range. For particles this size, uh, this occurs in the green wavelength range, uh, which makes the suspension of these particles look red. As you can see, there's literally no interaction with lights here at this wavelength. Um, and uh, uh, the 
position and intensity of this uh, LSPR band uh, depends just as uh, in the case of SPR um, on uh, the di dielectric properties of the vicinity of the particles. So if we, for example, immobilize uh, or adsorb some sort of biomolecules on these particles, we'll obtain a change uh, or a redshift typically in, in the plasmon band. Um, <clears throat> so um, essentially what we are detecting here is, is changes in refractive index, just uh, similar to SPR. Uh, and then we also have uh, this term here in this equation that determines the magnitude of this SPR shift or plasmon band shift. That's what we refer to as refractive index sensitivity. And we'll come back to that uh, during this talk quite a lot, what uh, we can do to, to essentially improve this, to increase sensitivity of sensors based on LSPR. Uh, we, can, we can also look what other aspects uh, uh, in the metanomostructures that influences uh, the optical properties here of this or sensor performance of, of sensors based on LSPR. And one such factor is the size of the particles, and, and that influences uh, the LSPR band quite a lot. And of course, also the dielectric function uh, of the metals used, so the materials essentially. I already mentioned the surrounding medium, and uh, of course, also the shape of uh, the nanoparticles that we're using or the nanostructures and also how uh, closely they are spaced if we get optical coupling between the particles. And optical coupling between particles is a phenomena that's been studied for quite uh, some time, I would say. Um, I, at least the, the earliest, uh, to my knowledge, uh, 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 record in, in the scientific literature is, is a paper by Michael Faraday from, from 1857 where he describes this phenomena uh, where you get the colorimetric shift of particles aggregating. Uh, and he also concludes in this part, in this paper, that this is actually uh, small pieces of metal uh, that was so tiny that he couldn't see them by, by his powerful microscopes, but just by uh, doing careful uh, scientific work, which is really interesting to, to read about. Uh, anyhow, um, also, uh, a few years later, in 1912, um, uh, Carl Friedrich Lange published uh, a paper on using this phenomena as well, the aggregation of particles and the optical coupling and the resultant uh, color change uh, for uh, diagnostics. So also, to my knowledge, the first uh, nanoparticle-based biosensor. Uh, and he used this phenomena for uh, diagnos uh, diagnostics of uh, patients with syphilis. Um, so essentially taking uh, cerebrospinal fluid from these patients and subjecting them to gold nanoparticles. And if you had syphilis, they started to aggregate. If you were healthy, they did not for some reason. Um, and this test was used for quite many year, years in, in the clinics. Uh, but uh, it can also be used for more uh, specific uh, biosensing, as, as we think of biosensing, where you actually have a, a biorecognition element. Uh, that triggers aggregation or deaggregation of particles as, uh, as a result of binding of the analyte. Um, and this can be done in, in many different ways. And um, the only limitation here is essentially, or there are a few actually, but one of the limitations, main limitations that you have to end up with particles that are close enough to get this optical coupling, which means that they usually need to end up uh, less than a separation less than the, this diameter of the particles. Uh, <clears throat> we and, the, uh, and uh, many others have investigated various ways to, to do this, uh, uh, for use this phenomena for biosensing. Uh, and this is one example from, uh, from our work uh, where we have been developing sensors for uh, lipases, which is a large group of enzymes that hydrolyzes lipids and also very highly interesting and relevant biomarkers for, for range of diseases and also drug targets. Uh, so, and lipases, they hydrolyze lipids. So the, the substrate is of course a lipid bilayer then. Uh, 
So we essentially, to go about this, uh, encapsulated a um, designed peptide inside liposomes. And this peptide is designed uh, in such a way that it can trigger aggregation of, uh, uh, <clears throat> of uh, gold nanoparticles uh, that are functionalized with a complementary peptide. And these particles are kept outside the liposomes. And then when we add uh, phospholipases, they start to degrade. The lipid bilayer eventually, the polypeptides will be released uh, due to this degradation process. And this uh, triggers an aggregation of, uh, <clears throat> of these um, um, particles. And we can monitor this as a sh essentially a redshift of the plasma band, uh, which is shown here on this axis. And then we monitor this process over time. And we can see that we can um, get slightly different magnitude in shift uh, depending on concentration, but above all, uh, the higher the concentration or activity of this enzyme, the faster is this release. <clears throat> and um, this were uh, then later also developed further uh, uh, together with collaborators into a uh, device for uh, diagnostics of uh, pancreatitis where you have quite a large overexpression of lipases. And this is an acute uh, pathological condition uh, which requires immediate attention by a physiologist or men, men, yeah, you need care within hours essentially. So a, a rapid diagnostic here is, is key for, for um, the correct treatment. And with this uh, um, lateral flow device based on this concept, uh, it was possible to diagnose pancreatitis in patients uh, in serum samples within 10 minutes. Um, so colorimetric sensors are, uh, has the advantage that they are simple. Um, and the, the readout is also very rapid and, and, and simple because you don't need any elaborate equipment. Typically, they are naked eye detection. You can use them to monitor enzyme uh, activity, as you saw in these examples. But they require elaborate assay design. Uh, and there's no generic ways to make these assays. You have to redesign them for each analyte, which is quite tedious. Um, and you also have some issues with nanoparticle stability since colloids are not thermodynamically stable. They tend to aggregate over time or due to unspecific adsorption of proteins. So that's why we also have paid quite a lot of attention to uh, refractive index sensing. So essentially approaching the same concept as used with SPR, just monitoring small changes in uh, refractive index uh, when biomolecules bind to the surface of nanoparticles. Because this is more generic sensing strategy, you don't have to consider nanoparticle stability, and you can have the particles immobilized on the substrate. Uh, the downside is that the, the shifts here, the optical shifts are very small, uh, and you uh, typically require a spectrophotometer of some sort. Uh, if we compare the the bulk refractive index sensitivity of um, LSPR and SPR, uh, there is an order of magnitude difference uh, or orders of magnitude difference depending on what particles we use here. And one of the main reasons for this, as I mentioned, in SPR we have a quite uh, large sensing depth. So we can detect uh, interactions occurring all the way from from the surface to 200 nanometers roughly from, from, from the surface or the interface. Whereas with particles, uh, the sensing depth is, is much more restricted, typically around 20 nanometers, as we can see when we just, if you adsorb polymer layers on top of the particles here, you can see that the, the shift decreases uh, quite dramatically. Um, so this is both an advantage and, and a limitation, as I can show you. Uh, the advantage, I would say, is that if you look here, most of the interaction actually occurs within this, uh, in this, uh, on this distance from the surface. So whatever goes on here, we're not typically really interested in, and that can actually just contribute in making the, the signal from the biorecognition event uh, more difficult to interpret. So if we instead just look at what happens in the vicinity of the surface, within 50 nanometers or so, we can see that yeah, then the, 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 there is not such a huge gap between 
uh, these simple uh, spherical 50 nanometer particles and uh, SPR as the method. Uh, and we can actually buy uh, using some more sophisticated uh, nanoparticles such as these uh, gold nanoframe protected silver nanoprism uh, actually outcompete uh, SPR at least within the first 20 nanometers or so from the surface. Uh, so obviously we have quite a large dependence here as you can see on the refractive index sensitivity on what kind of particles we use. Um, and, and we can uh, compete with SPR here in this instance. Uh, so uh, these uh, gold frame silver nanoprints, they, they are um, relatively good with respect to sensitivity. Um, and, and, but we see that there is also other particles that can perform rather well. Um, some are, are less complicated to uh, synthesize as compared to these prism. And the reason for having this uh, gold frame, I should say, is that silver in general is, although it has good uh, sensing performance, it's uh, very sensitive to oxidation. So in order to protect uh, the, or make, retain the, the morphology or geometry of these uh, prisms, uh, we protected them with, with this uh, gold layer. Uh, but the main reason why we see differences here in morphology or differences in uh, sensitivity for nanoparticles with different uh, shapes is because uh, uh, they have different uh, position of the LSVR band. And if you uh, plot uh, the position uh, of the, the LSPR band, the maximum, as we have done here against the sensitivity, you see that we can essentially have a straight line here. So there is a direct correlation between uh, the position of the, the LSPR band and the sensitivity and the higher the refractive index sensitivity, um, the, the higher um, the, the sensitivity. So, and then you might think that, okay, so if we could, uh, we can obtain this by elaborate synthesis of particles, but we could also have a shift in the plasmon band uh, by aggregating the particles. And, and that's true indeed. Uh, we can redshift the plasmon band uh, by just a specific aggregation of the particles. But as you can see, we also get a broadening then uh, of the plasmon band. And uh, <clears throat> that makes it more difficult to, uh, to uh, follow changes in the, in the, in the plasmon band. Um, so, and, and in order to essentially uh, have an, take that into account when we judge uh, the sensing performance of an LSPR device, we also need to look at the, the width uh, of the plasma band. And uh, we, we defined the so-called figure of merit as the sensitivity uh, divided by the full width half maximum. So the more narrow uh, the, the plasma band, the better typically the performance of, of, the, of the sensor. Uh, <clears throat> but we can still employ plasmonic coupling uh, to redshift the plasma band if we do this in a uh, more defined way than just on specific aggregation. And we can do it by essentially uh, making satellite structures of uh, smaller and larger particles separated by a well-defined uh, distance uh, using polymer layers, as in this case. Uh, and we can see that going from one very distinct plasma band to uh, essentially uh, split this up into several different plasma modes uh, due to this plasmonic coupling. And uh, we can see that we redshift uh, the second plasma mode here uh, more uh, the closer the particles are to each other. So just one polymer layer. We have a very well-defined second plasma band here that we can use for sensing. Um, and this actually gives us um, an increase in sensitivity with a factor of two to three uh, compared to the individual particles. And again, primarily an effect of uh, 
uh, the uh, redshift of the plasmon band. Uh, <clears throat> and in this case, uh, you probably notice that we also use the immobilized particles, and that's one of the key advantages with a refractive index sensing here that you don't have to work with particles that are suspended. Uh, and there are various ways to immobilize particles, and you can use all sorts of different uh, substrates, such as glass, silicon, metal polymers. And then you can tune the surface chemistry of these substrate, for example, by plasma treatment or for, by self-assembly of uh, monolayers with different uh, terminal functionalities we we'll just use uh, polymer adsorption in order to uh, bind uh, nanoparticles to the substrate. And then, of course, you can also um, adapt your uh, nanoparticle surface chemistry uh, to work well for this purpose, as well as in modulate the ionic strength to, for example, um, increase or decrease uh, packing of particles on the substrate. And these are some examples of uh, uh, sensor surfaces that we've uh, been working with, uh, primarily quite a lot with gold particles on glass. And uh, so this is what it can look like in electron microscope or uh, gold nanorods on plasma treated silicon oxide or uh, gold nanoparticles absorbed to a nanocellulose substrate or gold particles uh, absorbed or immobilized on a plastic substrate. Um, <clears throat> So there are many options here. Uh, so depending on your applications or what you want to study, you can essentially pick and choose whatever substrate uh, that works for you. Uh, but there are some uh, things you need to take into account and also when, when choosing substrate particle combination. Um, and um, as we can see in, in this data here, uh, here we have silver, spherical silver nanoparticles. And if we immobilize them on, on the glass substrate, there is, essentially not much of a difference in sensitivity, where if we go for cubes or, or plates, uh, also uh, silver-based, we see a quite dramatic decrease uh, in sensitivity. And these particles were originally more sensitive than, than the spheres here, but due to this effect, this difference is actually decreasing quite a lot. Uh, and this is due to, to essentially uh, the high refractive index of the substrate resulting in um, some of the electric fields are uh, distributed in uh, to the materials instead of probing uh, the surrounding medium. And the larger the contact area between the particle and the substrate, the larger is this um, <clears throat> substrate effect. So we should try to keep this at a minimum then or use, if this is critical, uh, uh, low refractive index uh, substrates. Um, and these differences are typically what we are talking about now um, um, with these particles. We, we typically rely on a spectrophotometer for, uh, to monitor these changes in refractive index, but we can uh, also with some uh, tricks uh, make them visible by naked eye. If, and that requires that we take the, the physiology of human vision into account. Uh, so, I mean, we, we, we can, we can uh, boost sensitivity by red shifting the plasmon band uh, to have um, particles that give rise to uh, uh, or produce a large shift in the plasmon band as a result of fairly small uh, refractive index uh, changes. And this is another example of highly performing particles for this particular purpose, uh, gold star nanoparticles. Uh, where we get a 40 nanometer shift from, from just roughly a 30% of monolayer proteins uh, absorbed on the particles. Uh, but still, we can't see any changes here by eye before and after absorption, absorption of these pot, uh, proteins on the surface. Whereas if we look on these particles instead, this is a gold silver alloy particle, uh, spherical. Uh, for a much smaller refractive index or LSPR shift, we actually can see this difference by, by the naked eye. Uh, and this is due to that this transition in, or this shift happens just as a transition between two colors where our eyes are essentially very sensitive to these changes. So here we can uh, actually, if we take this into account, we, we may not uh, even need a, a 
any kind of uh, spectrophotometer, we can use cell phones, for example, uh, to, to look at these color differences. Um, but in most cases, we have access to a simple spectrophotometer of uh, some kind. And for example, in, in most labs, uh, there are uh, plate readers available. And, and plate readers, they use uh, well plates um, um, as, as a, a carrier of samples, which comes in, in various uh, shapes and forms, but they are uh, always made of plastics, typically. Um, and since we can immobilize particles uh, on plastics, we can turn these uh, well plates into LSPR uh, sensor surfaces. And that's what you see here. The pink color here comes from particles uh, immobilized on uh, the plastic of these well plates. And uh, in this case, we were interested in making a, um, a sensor for detection of proteolytic activity. Uh, proteases are uh, highly important in numerous uh, physiological processes, but are also very interesting uh, biomarkers uh, for, for example, cancer and other inflammatory uh, diseases and in, also in infections. Uh, so as a model uh, protease, we use trypsin, which essentially hydrolyzes or digests uh, any protein. Um, and as a protein or as a substrate for, for trypsin, we use the casein, just physicolid on these particles. So a very simple setup and uh, then exposing uh, these sensors to trypsin, uh, we can see that we get a, in this case, um, a blue shift of the plasmon band. Uh, so this shows the LSPR band uh, during the casein immobilization or functionalization of the particles with casein, we have a red shift. And when we degrade the casein, we remove, uh, of course, uh, mass from the surface, which we see as a, a slight change in the LSPR band and intensity, um, <clears throat> but sufficiently large to see this uh, quite clearly with a, with a plate reader. And uh, using this uh, simple uh, strategy, we can, we can detect uh, fairly low concentrations of, of trypsin. Um, but it was not trypsin that was our main target in this case. Uh, we were interested in uh, um, uh, monitoring uh, proteases uh, involved in a proteolytic disease um, in the, the oral cavity. Um, so this is uh, probably something many of you have experienced, the bleeding gum. And this is usually uh, what, what you see when you're suffering from periodontal disease, which is a bacterial infection, a chronic inflammation of the gum, which eventually leads to tooth uh, loss. And it's also associated with high risk for Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular disease. Um, and the main um, pathogenic uh, driver in this uh, disease uh, are the, the, the bacteria, Porphyrmonas gingivalis, uh, which secrete gingipines, which is a group of enzymes that degrades the tissues. Uh, so uh, this disease is typically uh, diagnosed, as you see here, by probing the dental pockets, the gingival pockets. Uh, and that's essentially when, when we can, I mean, that's the late stage of the disease, essentially, when it's harder to, to, to do something about it. So the, the dentists are looking for um, simple and rapid ways to detect uh, this uh, um, biomarkers at an earlier stage. And um, we tested the same approach here for gingipines uh, and were able uh, also with the plate reader to detect the clinically relevant uh, concentrations of gingipines, both KGPs and RGPs um, in, in uh, essentially concentrations uh, similar to, to what uh, can be used uh, or is required for, for early diagnostics. Um, <clears throat> but in addition to diagnostics, uh, we are also interested in uh, exploring LSPR bio biosensors for uh, bioprocess monitoring, and in particular uh, processes aiming at uh, pr production of biopharmaceuticals, such as therapeutic antibodies, which are um, quite new kind of, of drugs that are 
essentially changing the entire, uh, currently the entire pharma industry now. Uh, as we get better tools for developing uh, new uh, biopharmaceuticals. Um, but the problem here is that these processes, I mean, here we rely on culturing of cells and cells to express uh, these uh, complex molecules, and then they need to be purified through several steps. And, and these processes are um, associated with very high costs, and they're quite complex, and, and takes very much time essentially to produce these drugs and one of the main reasons is that um, th there is a huge um, there's a complete lack of methods to monitor uh, both um, the actual product being produced and also some key uh, contaminants during this process making it very difficult to uh, intensify and make these processes more uh, continuous and to make them more uh, automatic. Uh, so our ambition here is to essentially facilitate uh, work to intensify by production by essentially enabling inline quality control and uh, detection of, for example, product type or product variants or contaminants. Uh, and we do this by essentially uh, using sensors similar to what you see in this illustration here. So a flow cell, uh, very simple, uh, um, combined with an, an optical fiber uh, that's connected to, to light source and a detector. And then we have a, a removable sensor chip um, um, that is functionalized with um, particles. And it looks uh, like this. So stainless steel flow cell inlet outlet and optical fiber and in here you have the sensor chip. And with this fairly simple device, uh, we can um, we can outcompete essentially uh, current techniques for uh, at line detection of, for example, uh, tighter both with respect to sensitivity and dynamic range, but above all uh, the speed. I mean here we can detect. Uh, or get a result within minutes uh, on the product tighter throughout the entire bioprocess that from the complex soup of biomolecules uh, with very low uh, tighter concentrations in the upstream process throughout the, the purification and clarification um, uh, steps. Um, and very good correlation uh, uh, to these other methods that typically take hours to, to, to get the same results. Uh, and also we can, at least when using it at line, uh, uh, get information on binding kinetics, so similar to, to what you can do with the uh, BECOR instrument. And we can also uh, quite easily adopt the instrument uh, to uh, monitor, analyze, or a quite wide um, dynamic range um, from essentially nanomolar up to uh, millimolar. And we are also exploring inline applications, for example, to monitor product breakthrough in chromatography steps where these uh, sensors, as you can see in this uh, photograph here, is connected to a chromatography equipment uh, on pilot scale. So roughly flows, flow rates around 150 milliliters per minute. And uh, to detect uh, um, <clears throat> essentially when, when the product saturates the column and then you want to uh, you can use this essentially to optimize the usage of, of, of this extremely expensive chromatography medium. This is currently not possible to do with UV chromatography since there are so many other proteins there. Uh, the signal in the UV uh, spectrophotometer is saturated, whereas here we see a clear binding when uh, the product uh, essentially is uh, uh, or when your column is saturated and the, the, the product is starting to go through. And uh, we can see this even better if we zoom in. Uh, there is no essential signal at all in the UV, whereas with the LSPR, we can clearly distinguish when, when the product is, is going through the system. Um, <clears throat> uh, but there is still uh, definitely a lot of room for improvements here. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, a glass uh, substrate that has uh, been functionalized with gold nanoparticles. 
and you can see this faint uh, pink color comes from the particles. And here we actually have fairly high uh, density of particles there. Uh, you, you can, of course, squeeze in more particles there. Uh, it's definitely possible. But then this starts to happen that we get the broadening of the plasma band and the redshift. And that uh, kind of have a negative impact on our figure of merit and the sensing performance. So we, we can't really improve the signal intensity by just uh, squeezing in more particles here. Um, so we started to look on um, possibilities to instead uh, increasing number of particles in, in the third dimension by using three-dimensional substrates. And one such substrate that uh, caught our attention was uh, nanocellulose hydrogels. So these are essentially uh, biopolymeric materials, uh, water-rich uh, uh, materials, uh, but can be produced at really with really high quality and reproducibility. And what you see here in the bottom of this cuvette is uh, one of these uh, membranes here, cellulose membranes. And we wanted to uh, develop an approach where we use self-assembly of particles in here so we can start with well-defined particles. There's been a number of papers published on, on uh, attempts to synthesize particles in nanocellulose, but then you don't have the same control over uh, particle size uh, and composition and shape as you can do if you prepare uh, particles separately and then uh, adsorb them in the cellulose. So after some optimization, we were able to uh, essentially make all these particles go from being suspended to being adsorbed in uh, this membrane. And as you can see here, we end up with a substrate that is not faint, uh, faint uh, pink, but bright red. Uh, we can also increase this uh, intensity quite much more, but then you start to get a, a broadening of the plasma band. But in this case, we have a very well-defined uh, plasma band. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is due to the particles being well, fairly well distributed within this three-dimensional matrix, both on the surface, but also throughout the entire volume of this uh, hydrogels. And when we compare the intensity between these three-dimensional materials and the two-dimensional, we can see that there's a quite a substantial difference here. But if we uh, normalize uh, the data here, we see that there's no shifts or anything or broadening of the curves. So uh, there are still, um, essentially, we have the same figure of merit. And this is also due to the, there's no differences in, in refractive index sensitivity here. Uh, so what this means is that we increase the signal or we increase the signal to noise. Uh, and for the 2D uh, surfaces, we have a signal to noise ratio roughly around 250. Whereas in this case, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, substantially higher, so around 450. And what this in practice means that we uh, have a much better reproducibility uh, when, when we uh, measure things uh, because there is less influence from noise. And uh, if we just look at an example here where we adsorb uh, bovine serum albumin on the surfaces here, uh, we see that there is quite small variation here in the pink uh, uh, three-dimensional data here, whereas in the blue here, two-dimensional data, there is lots, lot, quite much larger variations due to the higher signal to noise. Uh, but this technique uh, with the self-assembly here of the particles in the uh, membranes, we can also uh, essentially immobilize all sorts of different kinds of, of particles or a combination of particles as well to, to do more elaborate uh, nanoplasmonic materials. Uh, so that was, we thought was quite interesting, but something that really caught our attention was uh, what happened when we uh, subjected these composite materials to a bit of mechanical pressure. Um, then we saw that we got to change in color, similar to what we see when we aggregated particles. But when we looked at this in the electron microscope, the particles were still fairly well separated. There was no difference here. Uh, so this is essentially just an effect of pressing or compressing the material and making the particles immobilized on individual fibrils to come close enough for us to get the plasmonic coupling. Uh, 
Um, and we started exploring what could essentially influence this uh, mechanoplasmonic coupling. Uh, so when comparing an uncompressed material with a compressed material, we see a quite distinct uh, color differences. Uh, but if we immobilize uh, a protein or just by physisorption on the particles before we compress, we don't see a much of a color change. So essentially the proteins here can prevent uh, the particles from being mechanically forced into contact. Uh, so by essentially using uh, mechanical pressure here, we can uh, sense what goes on uh, on, on the nanoparticle surface. And uh, also reasonably then, uh, the more proteins you have, uh, on the surface, the more efficient are these proteins than inhibiting this uh, mechanoplasmonic response here. So we can also get a concentration dependent response. And with that, I would like to thank all uh, the people in the group that uh, has done all this work, uh, especially uh, Olaf Eskison, uh, Robert Selegord, Tori Tran, and Anna Sverd, and also our collaborators and colleagues. Uh, around the world and funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this uh, very nice presentation. I think it's time for question. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Hay alguna pregunta de la audiencia? No sé si en el respaldo nos puedan facilitar las preguntas. Okay, I, I have a, a question. Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting, Daniel. Um, uh, have you measured the stability of the protein mobilized? And um, this is because, uh, well, it, it, um, it's the, uh, about the all proteins, but especially for antibody in solution, these molecules are not very stable. But uh, have you measured this, this, this uh, properties? Yeah, uh, it's, that's, that's a good question. I mean, it's very important if you, I mean, you, you mean the proteins that on the sensor surface or yeah, so I mean, like in the case here with the with the sensors we develop for bioprocess monitoring, uh, we use protein A uh, for detection of um, antibodies. Uh, to a large extent, at least, we use protein A, and that's a fairly stable protein. Uh, we we can use these uh, chips for we we typically use them within three days. But uh, if we store them in, in fridge, it's, it's, it's reproducible over three days. Uh, but of course, this is something we, we need to look into if, if um, um, in optimize storage conditions. Um, and and I, I assume that's possible. I mean, you can buy sensor chips from, from BIA Core, for example, with protein A that lasts for years. So there are techniques to essentially preserve the proteins on the surface. But then we are also interested in using uh, these kind of sensors to look at uh, stability of other proteins. Uh, for example, antibodies, as you measure, they aggregate in, in solution, for example, or they can be degraded. Uh, and that's, uh, that's also something which is very interesting with production of uh, therapeutic antibodies to, to follow this and get the measure on how much of the antibodies are aggregated or degraded. Uh, and uh, we are currently looking at differences in binding affinities, for example, depending on if you, if you have a, an aggregate uh, or a, a fragmented antibody. And, and we see some quite interesting differences in, in the, the binding to, to our sensor surfaces, just using protein A as a, as a ligand. But then also when it comes to stability of ligands, we are also developing our own ligands based on peptides instead of proteins, since proteins are inherently stable. Uh, they won't last forever, but peptides, uh, I mean, we can make them synthetically and, and they're much cheaper from that perspective. Uh, and 
they last um, for as long as you like. I mean, they don't typically have any secondary structure to quaternary structure that can be disrupted. Um, but then, yeah, then you have to do some more kind of screening of, of of affinities and, and do some sequence optimization. But th there, is, there, there are quite many methods for doing that. In, in my lab, we work with a technique called uh, one bead, one compound uh, peptide libraries for uh, development of new uh, peptide binders, which is a fairly rapid screening methods for, for identifying new, new ligands. No, it's okay. And, and where, more or less where I'm on, Body is uh, in the same orientation when it's um, in, in immobilizers. Uh, all is a 100, all, all the molecules are in the same orientation, I suppose that no, or, or more or less. No. Uh, no, I mean, typically, depending on what me method you use for immobilization, uh, it's random. Typically, I mean, if we just rely on fixed absorption, which we can do, then very random. Uh, quite often, we, we have some self assembled monolayer on the particles uh, and use uh, a conjugation strategy that typically targets like primer amines on, on, the, on the, the ligands. Then, uh, still random, I would say. Um, when it comes to peptides, I mean, then, then, then we can introduce uh, functional groups in the peptides, which we can use for directed immobilization. So, that's another advantage. Um, and, and we use, for example, click chemistry um, with uh, A side functionalized uh, peptides and uh, strained alkynes on the surface. Or we also use uh, cysteine functionalized uh, peptides uh, quite a lot. Okay, it's very direct in no? mobilization because it's, it's a profane, for example, in enzymes are very important no? to, to um, how is the, the, the region of the Proteins that immobilize support the function, and mm. you are direct. Uh, yeah, it, it it definitely influences the perf performance. I mean, those mm. uh, those um, ligands that are immobilized in, in a geometry where they can't bind to, to the analyte, they are just not contributing to the sensor response. It's essentially, just occupying the area and, and reducing sensitivity of the sensor. So it's I mean, it's an important aspect. Uh, I mean, by protein engineering, of course, you can introduce various also tags to facilitate directed immobilization. Uh, but that's nothing we are working with. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, and uh, about the size of proteins, um, it depends of the, the proteins that you want to immobilize uh, in these nanoparticles. It depends of the size of the nanoparticles, or uh, is a standard size of the nanoparticles and you can um, immobilize any 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 mm. size of, of proteins or other or, or is there a limit that's a, that's a good question i mean um, we, we we primarily use just simple spherical 50 nanometer gold particles for most of our sensors refractive index sensors even though they are quite poor with respect to refractive index sensitivity, but they have a fairly good figure of merit since we can make them with a very well-defined size and and, and uh, size distribution. Uh, but then, then of course, also we, I mean, the sensing depth here is, I guess, what is the main limitation. It's it's not like we, we don't have room for, for the ligands on the particles, but uh, since the sensing depth is roughly 20 nanometers, if we would have a huge ligand, yeah. like an, an antibody oriented, like with a constant um, part uh, directed towards the surface, it's kind of 50 nanometers in size. Uh, so then you're essentially just using the mo five most uh, outmost nanometers in the sensing depth here for, for detection. So that's not ideal, actually. So the smaller the ligand, the better, actually, then you, you get the more sensitive sensor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Interesting question. Thank you, Dr. Claudia. Eh, Hay alguien en la audiencia que o los invitamos a hacer alguna pregunta, alguien que quiera preguntar o compartirnos. Este, ¿me escuchan, doctor Mendoza? Sí, doctor. 
Ah, es que mandé una por el chat, pero no sé si la, si la pueden ver. No, no, tengo no, no la, se ve. No se, puede. no se ve. Ajá, ok. Sí. Ok, este, eh, es en relación a las dimensiones de los sensores. Uh -huh. ¿sí? si, típicamente, ¿cuáles son eh, las dimensiones de los sensores que, okay. que, que están en desarrollo? Y si, esa, y si esas dimensiones en un momento dado influyen en, en la relación señal a ruido. Sí. Eh, Daniel, uh, doctor, uh, profesor Gerardo Antonio so is asking, what are the dimensions of the sensors that you are developing? And mm -hmm. if the dimension can influence in the signal to noise ratio? Yeah, um, that's also an interesting question. Currently we are, I mean, if we talk about the sensor chips that we use for bioprocess monitoring, they are a few millimeters in diameter. Um, we actually started out this work with making fiber optical sensors for uh, monitoring biomarkers in a mouse brain. Um, then, so we, we first start, <laughs> we, we try to make them very small. We can make them well, very small. I mean, they, they're less than, than a millimeter in diameter, I would say, in, in that case. And that works. Uh, but it was very tedious to work with. Uh, it can influence uh, sensitivity in uh, at least when using these kind of uh, fiber optical detector that we use, uh, because uh, we need to collect uh, the scattered photon or the, the, the reflected photons. And uh, with this setup that we use, that's a limitation. So we, we can't really go much smaller, but in essence, there is not so much a, 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 you're not limited in size. Essentially, you can do refractometric sensing on a single nanoparticle uh, using dark field microscopy. Um, so we can go tiny if needed. Okay, uh, muchas gracias, uh, Dr. Gerardo. No sé si haya alguien más de la audiencia que quiera preguntar. Okay, I have not received another question yet, so we have three minutes left, but I would like to ask you if, uh, have you tried to immobilize another uh, nanoparticle shapes like a nanorods, nanotubes for the, for example, in the polyesterine wells? For this paper of Anna? Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, we do. Uh, and you can do this essentially using a similar approach. Uh, so it's possible um, uh, using, using by plasma treating the plastic, you can make mm -hmm. it slightly negatively charged uh, to immobilize uh, rods that are C uh, tab or capped. Uh, as long as you wash away um, excess surfactants first. Yeah. Well, in that case, I think that we, you need to do a, a skeleton. Uh, you need to exchange this detergent with the citrate. So I think we just use one. No, we, we can use CTAB. You don't have to exchange it. Uh, uh -huh. Actually, the CTAB, since it's positively charged, it facilitates the, the immobilization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, at least from my experience, uh, exchanging the CTAB is, is quite tricky. Uh, perhaps you, you know how to do this. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I just end um, up with aggregated particles when trying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, in this experiment of the, in the, in the well plate, so mm -hmm. have you seen a change in the enzyme activity because you have the substrate in, on the particles and then you add the enzyme? So did you see some change in the enzyme activity compared when you do the, just the, the proteolysis in normal conditions without particles? Um, we have, it, yeah. when comparing to, to other methods for detection of the proteolytic activity, um, which we did use in, in this paper, we, I, we, I can't say we saw any differences, um, but we didn't look at that in detail actually. It was more yeah. focused towards actually just seeing how how sensitive or low in concentration we could go. But it's yeah. an interesting uh, question, actually. Because I imagine that you can do the other way around, immobilize enzyme, and then detect some uh, ligand or something. 
mm -hmm. subscribe is a we'll see what happens as well mm -hmm. true true uh, yeah if you, if you, if you, if it's yeah for essentially drug development uh, sensor purposes you can do it like this you, you can develop something that is supposed to inhibit for example enzymatic activity yeah okay well i think it's time for conclude this very nice talk and thank you very much daniel for the accept the invitation and mm -hmm. well uh, i don't know if the doctor dr claudia has some other question uh, some words uh, only thank you very much uh, so much uh, for the interesting talk again and we hope that very soon we we can meet again and yeah. uh, in the next few days you will receive an knowledge uh, acknowledgement for your participation and thank you so much and uh, bueno para todos los que nos están eh, siguiendo tenemos eh, continuamos con las otras actividades que son presentaciones orales y en la tarde a las 4 de la tarde tenemos eh, la conferencia del doctor Augusto García por favor este eh, bueno estén atentos a, la, a los horarios eh, los invitamos a seguir participando en en este en, en ambos eventos eh, hoy mañana y el viernes ¿no? en la tarde eh, vamos a seguir con otras eh, conferencias magistrales en la página del ICAT pueden encontrar eh, ahí el, el programa de, de SOMI y de Biosensores de ambos eventos es en, en manera conjunta muchísimas gracias um, no sé si alguien más tiene algún comentario eh, muchas gracias Claudia eh, a todos los participantes eh, doctor Sanela eh, desde luego a uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Aili, for your nice uh, talk. Um, al Dr. Silvestre Mendoza por su intervención. Desde luego, muchísimas gracias también. Uh, Dr. Sanela, muy amable, muchas gracias por el apoyo y por estar atento al desarrollo y al curso del, del Congreso. Y ya lo dijo la doctora Claudia, les invitamos a seguir en este momento el programa del Congreso ya con los eh, trabajos que presentan sus participantes eh, a modo de video. Recuerden que las preguntas las pueden enviar eh, por el chat y les serán remitidas a los autores eh, a sus correos electrónicos. Sí, les agradecemos mucho eh, y continuamos con el programa durante todo el día. Eh, eh, tenemos salida a comer a las 2 de la tarde y recuerden, ya lo dijo la doctora eh, Claudia, Eh, a las cuatro, una interesantísima conferencia también con el doctor Augusto García Valenzuela. Hasta entonces, muchas gracias. Continuamos. Gracias. Luego. Thank Goodbye, you, Daniel. Daniel. Thank you very much.